Hello, I'm Shannon Tiezzi from The Diplomat, and I'm happy to be joined today by Christine Fair, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Security Studies program at Georgetown University. Dr. Fair, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Today we're going to be discussing the horrific terrorist attack in Peshawar, Pakistan, at a school where over 130 children were killed and at least nine of the staff members at the school. Christine, um, obviously I think everyone's having a little trouble processing what happened. What is the national mood like in Pakistan? Well, I'm not sure the national mood is, is perhaps the right question to understand this, this situation. The first thing is that this isn't the first large-scale large attack on a school. Um, if you actually look at the data, there have been hundreds of attacks on schools all across Pakistan in the last decade. So this is something that the Pakistani Taliban uh, do with some considerable frequency. Typically, however, they attack girls' schools. Um, that's because the, you know educating females is seen as something that is a, a Western ploy to um, degrade Islam and Pakistani cultural values and, and narratives of, of this variety. So what makes this different is that they attacked a boys' school. And given the, the way in which schooling takes place in Pakistan, girls' schools tend to be smaller. Families don't want to send their girls um, to school if the school is far away from home. So you'll have more schools and they'll be smaller. But this was a boys' school. And so this is distinctive in that measure. It's also distinctive in that this was a, um, a Pakistan army public school. And the Taliban, the Pakistani Taliban, I will be very clear that they're not the same organization as the Afghan Taliban, actually had a list of sons of, of ranking military officers that they sought to kill. So in many ways, this, this was different, but it was certainly building off of a well-known tactic of the Taliban, which is attacking schools. Now, what I, what I find is kind of interesting about the Pakistani um, public sentiment right now is that um, they, they do want to create the image that this is somehow like the worst thing that's ever happened to Pakistan. And of course, that's just not true. There have been other terrorist attacks that have been exactly on this scale. Uh, for example, um, attacks on religious minorities. And it doesn't provoke this kind of outrage. So the one thing that people have to understand about Pakistanis and their response to violence is that it's a very selective outrage. Some people are worthy of being killed, and some people are not worthy of being killed. And by the way, that's an actual expression. Wajibul Qatul means worthy of being killed. So you have um, those people who obviously see this as something that's really quite new and quite outrageous. But even while Pakistan's military and civilian leaders are decrying this in English, if you look at the Urdu media, the people that they're blaming for this are not the Pakistani Taliban. They're blaming the Indians. So when you, you have to, when you ask, you know, what is the public sentiment, it really depends upon what is your source of data to assess that sentiment. If you look at popular commentators all over Pakistan's um, private television uh, channels in Urdu, they're blaming the Indians for this. So it's really hard to take seriously the pronouncements of Pakistan's military and civilian officials that they're taking the terrorism problem seriously when they are actively disseminating misinformation to, to misdiagnose the nature of the problem. So how would you interpret then uh, the comments by Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif saying that they are going to strike back hard at terrorism, they're not going to distinguish between good Taliban and bad Taliban? I can't even take it seriously. I mean, I, I, I hear it and I and I, I just I just squirm with with discomfort because even as the the children um, who were killed in this attack were waiting to be buried, Pakistan released on bail one of the senior most terrorists associated with Lashkar Taiba, who was involved in uh, the attack on Mumbai in 2008. So how do you take seriously? We're not distinguishing between good terrorists and bad terrorists when they're letting this fellow go on bail. Now, I will say, even when he was in jail, it was a joke. He was running terrorist operations from his jail cell. He had an elite suite. He was able to father a child from jail. So this idea that, that Pakistan is turning a new leaf, it's taking terrorism seriously, this is all just a bunch of rubbish. I mean, they're basically trying to get money from the United States government. They have no intention of doing thing, doing anything any differently. I, I just can't say that more clearly. 
So what about their operations specifically against the um, Pakistani Taliban? You had yeah. General Rahil Sharif go to Afghanistan to try to discuss cooperation and eliminating the leaders. Do you think that that is an angle they're going to pursue more aggressively? Well, the first thing you have to understand what this operation was and what this operation wasn't. So they had announced this operation for five months before they actually went in. Five months. And um, the reason why they had such a long lead up was that th what they were trying to do was take parts of the Pakistani Taliban and, and break them up into subsections if, or, or, or break up the organization um, along other potential battle spaces. So those parts of the Pakistan Taliban that they could persuade through inducements, read that as money, <laughs> um, and also threat of violence, to go to Afghanistan to fight us and our allies there, they did that. So a large part of that organization went off to Afghanistan to kill us and our allies. Then another part of that organization um, originally drew from a series of groups that operated in India. And so the ISI had been, which is Pakistan's intelligence organization, was trying to rehabilitate that part of the Pakistani Taliban and persuade those elements to be willing to go kill Indians. So if you were following South Asia in the fall of this year, there was a bunch of shelling that was taking place in September and October. The shelling's important because that's how the Pakistanis insert the terrorists into Kashmir. They basically um, use the artillery fire to distract the Indian security forces and then the terrorists infiltrate across the line of control. And they have to do that before the snows come. So having done this, what remained was the, the rump of the TTP that couldn't be converted into a good terrorist to go kill in Afghanistan or go kill in India, but rather those hardcore elements that only wanted to kill Pakistani. So that's what this operation has been about. Now, the US government knows that this was always about splitting the Pakistani Taliban into these different elements. We still support them in what they're doing in North Waziristan, but we also know that this has also come at a high price for us and our allies in Afghanistan, and the Indians are going to pay a high price for this. So it's really important to understand that even as they're conducting this operation, it was always about taking parts of that organization and convincing them to go fight elsewhere, leaving behind only those that really want to take on the Pakistan army. So do you think there's any serious hope for collaboration between Afghanistan and Pakistan then? It's a joke for the following reason. What Pakistan wants, Pakistan wants Molana Fazullah. That's the leader of the Pakistani Taliban. It is true. He, he, according to all assessments, he is in Afghanistan. Um, the Afghans are not going to want to give him up so easily because the Afghans are really angry at the Pakistanis for supporting the Afghan Taliban Really, and you know, going back certainly 1994 and prior to the Afghan Taliban manipulating Afghan internal affairs, so the Afghans are not going to want to give up this this prize because it's it's one of the few actors that they have where they can actually retaliate in some measure against the Pakistanis. Uh, at the end of the day, Pakistan wants Afghanistan to be a client state, and Afghanistan doesn't want to be a client state. And the only way Pakistan has to manipulate what happens in Afghanistan are basically Islamist militants. So I don't, if you just look at what the, the national interests are of these two states, the scope for cooperation is absolutely negligible. And you mentioned earlier that um, there are some commenters in Pakistan who are blaming the Peshawar attack on India. Is this going to have a long-term impact uh, on Pakistan-India relations? Well, so what one has to understand is that whenever there's been an attack of any consequence, the way in which Pakistani intelligence defers public criticism, because basically what is the TTP, the Pakistani Taliban? It is an amalgamation of militant organizations that the ISI itself sponsored, right? So there would be no Pakistani Taliban had there been no Afghan Taliban, had there been, um, had the ISI not created a whole series of so-called Kashmiri groups, which then defected after 2001 and joined the TTP, had the ISI not used sectarian militants to manage internal security. So what the ISI doesn't want um, is Pakistanis generally to begin questioning the nature of this nemesis and how it came out to be, and they don't want them realizing that this is blowback. So whenever there has been a significant terrorist attack, they'll always say, 
the terrorists were uncircumcised. The implication being they're Hindus, right? Um, you saw this with the Karachi airport attack. Oh, the terrorists were uncircumcised. They were Hindus. So this is actually a very standard tactic that they deploy after these attacks. So they want Pakistanis to believe that these are Indians or they're agents of India rather than Pakistani Muslims, former proxies of the ISI, slaughtering their children. So despite the you know, public outcry, despite the horrific nature of the attack, you're thinking business nothing. as usual. It's business as usual. Nothing is going to change. And, and, and actually, as this narrative of the Indians doing this um, begins to seep in, it's going to dampen any outrage, you know, in the sense that these aren't, these aren't Muslims who did it. These are Hindus that did it. Um, and it's and the genius of this, of Pakistan's military making this argument, is that it dampens any criticism that says our biggest threat's internal. And therefore, why do we have this large conventional army, right? What the army is able to do by manipulating this message about the perpetrator is say, see, India's our problem. These aren't, these aren't Muslims killing Muslims. These are the very clever, wily, foxy Hindus that are perpetrating um, this violence against our people. So it's a very insidious, very clever strategy by which the military continues its policy of, of using terrorists as tools of foreign policy while managing public outrage over the blowback that derives from this policy. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have, yep. but thank thanks you. for talking through some of the ramifications for us. All right, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us. Once again, I'm Shannon Tiezzi from The Diplomat.